but what God can do. I thank you. Let us bow our head in prayer. It is in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that we stand before just God, who's able to do all things but feel. We're grateful for a safe passage, for the hard work, for the determination, for the pushing forward, for never being weary in well doing. The heartbeat started years ago, and now you have gathered us together in this wonderful weather. You are in control of. We thank you for each heart beats today. We are not unmindful, of God, that there are many who has worked on tireless to make sure that their assignment has been completed. But we are charged today that our assignment hasn't been completed at yet. So continue to strengthen, lead, God, and direct us that when our assignment has been completed, then somebody somewhere will stand and give accolades to those who has gone on as one day we will leave this side of the vineyard. We thank you, Lord. Bless as only you can. Anoint the heart. Whatever is said and done today, let it become a lasting memory. But not only to die today, but to carry on until the last breath is breathed. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It is my esteemed pleasure to bring before you greetings from our honorable. Joseph P. Riley, Jr., Mayor of the wonderful city of Charleston. Let us give him a round of applause as he comes. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend. And uh, this is such a, a beautiful sight. Uh, and a wonderful moment in the history of the city in our country. I know that uh, council member, my colleague on council, Dudley Gregory is here, council member Gregory. Uh, council member Rodney Williams, uh, right there, perhaps other members of council. Uh, whatever happens in the city of Charleston, uh, it's good, is a result of our wonderful city council and I have the joy and pleasure of working with them. I wish to, to just thank everybody who had a role in this, and, and it's impossible to begin, if I begin naming to, to adequately do that because so many people will be left out. But uh, certainly from the city of Charleston Council, that supported this, funded the funding and this, uh, marvelous parks department, Steve Livingston, our landscape architect, head of the Farben, Jerry Ebling, head of the department now, Jason Consberg. Joanne Greeland and others for for helping select the site and, and, and the site it it works perfectly. We all can see that and feel that. It's a site not tucked away, but yet also a little bit away from the bustle so that it's a place for, for contemplation and a place for honor in this beautiful park. I congratulate uh, the Wonderful sculpture, Ed Wright, uh, Dorothy Wright, who worked early work in commemorating Denmark Bessie and the painting that the city was so proud to commission many years ago. Amidst some controversy, to be sure, that it was so important that we do so. And, and the committee. But, but there's one person that is, uh, that is the primary reason that we're here today. And that is Charleston County Council Member Henry Darby. If, uh, yeah. 
you know, uh, Mr. Council Member Darby is an excitable person, and he's got a lot of energy. Um, <laughs> but but he's a very humble man. Yes. A very humble person. If I had one conversation or meeting with Henry Darby about Denmark, Bessie, Memorial Statue in Charleston, I had between 50 and 100. Over the, that's, that's no exaggeration. Um, he, his determination, you know, things that, that occur in the community sometimes seem to just be natural and, uh, and preordained or uh, but, but people make them happen. And this, this day in this monument is a tribute to the perseverance of Council Member Henry Darby and Council Member Darby. I thank you so much for all you did to make today possible. This is so important for, for Charleston history, for African American history, for America's history. And African American history is, is American history. When we study and understand that part of American history that we didn't have the opportunity or, or there wasn't the ability to study, it, it's about understanding America, people who shaped America, who we are as a country, how we came to be, what makes us, all of us, the 350 million people who are Americans. Is why our work is so important on the International African American Museum, which city council is funded, county council is given funding for it, working for the state, and right private money to build it, because it's presenting American history, that portion that we do not understand, and in the process to honor those who came here against their will and their fortitude and courage and determination made this country what it is. Amen. And in Denmark, Bessie, there is a there is a, a direct line with lots of people and events in the fleet. From Denmark, Bessie, to Nelson Mandela. When I met Nelson Mandela, he mentioned to me the impact that Dr. King and the civil rights movement in America had on him as he was sitting in that lonely jail for more than a quarter of a century. He knew that what had happened in America gave him the courage to know that it could happen in South Africa. Uh, the Dr. King and the early pioneers of the civil rights movement knew the history of Denmark Bessie. It, it's all about making people free. The undeniable fact, and lots of, you know, uh, lack of certainty of every precise thing that happened regarding uh, Denmark Bessie and his efforts, uh, the, un the undeniable fact is this. Denmark Bessie was free. He was a free black man. No one owned him. He was free. And he risked his life and gave his life to make enslaved people free. That's why, that's why this one is so important. And, 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 and we're so proud. We're so proud in Charleston. In this historic park, it is, you know, the first uh, Memorial Day event in America was here. Right here is Hampton Park. Uh, in this historic park, in this, in this beautiful space, we have the opportunity for all who come from adjacent neighborhoods or countries far away to contemplate the courage of this man to help make his brothers and sisters free. The inspiration from that will be meaningful and constructive for all who come 
and honor a Denmark vessel. Thank you very much. Yeah. We do thank our beloved mayor, city of Charleston, for those wonderful, heartfelt remarks. Due to the emergency, Honorable Teddy Pryor, Chairman Charleston County Council, could not be with us. Certainly, his prayers and his presence invisibly will be with us. We agree. Reading you now is Reverend Joseph Darby, he and me, presiding elder of the district, and after Reverend Joseph Darby, immediately after would be Mr. Donald West, History Humanities Department, Trident Technical College, in recognition of the VC Monument. Committee, that order. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. A great pleasure meeting this presiding elder of the Church of Denmark, Mrs. Choice, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. When we broke ground for this monument a little bit more than three years ago, I noted the belief of some on that day that it would be a very cold day in South Carolina <laughs> 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 we broke ground on an unusual cold day. Some people who make rude comments in the paper said that the groundbreaking was the end of things and that it would be a cold day before the statue ever got built. Here we are, ready to unveil the monument after two bouts of ice and snow in South Carolina. All due respect to those who might not share my faith, God does move in this curious way. There is a hopeful step on the road to racial reconciliation in our city and in our state. Some people see Denmark, D.C. as a dangerous terrorist, just as some in Martin Luther King's day saw him as a dangerous terrorist. Just as some crazy folk today see Barack Obama as a dangerous terrorist. Others like me and most, if not all of you, see him as a freedom fighter who advocated for equity, who stood and who sacrificed for freedom. All of us have, should see him as one who stood for freedom, not just for his fellow members of South Carolina's first day in the church, but for all of those who were bound and seeking freedom. My hope is that this monument will add to the full story of Southern hip heritage and the Southern history. It will inspire our generation and coming generations to stand for truth, to stand for justice, to stand for freedom. And we embrace that hope, seek inclusion instead of division, and really do appreciate the diversity of our unity, the unity of our diversity. And we can work together, stand together, change America and South Carolina together, and do so in the spirit of those who first sang in Greece's year and walked together to it. Don't you get weird. It's a great camp meet in the promised land. Thank you and God bless you. Just brief remarks and then I'm going to list the names. I've said it several times. I know the committee members have said it too. But at our first meeting, if someone had said it would be 17 or 18 years, I probably wouldn't have come to the next meeting. <laughs> but the members I'm going to list now are individuals who persevere for 18 years plus. The directors, Huey E. Darby, Marion Welch, Curtis J. Franks, and myself. Current and past committee members include Eleanor Coulson, Thomas P. Williams, Dr. Wilmot Frazier, Nicole Green, Samuel Hart, Terry Ford, Dr. Bernard Powers, Dr. W. Marvin Delancey, Nett Tisdale, Dorothy Wright, Jennifer Fashion, Mario Gaston, James Smart, and David Ross. If you're here, please stand and be recognized.
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. West. Now, the purpose, the monument, this is Dorothy Wright, the artist. Then the musical selection, Mr. Jonathan Q. Crash, Minister of Music, Montcarmo, EME Church. Good afternoon. We started on this journey almost 20 years ago. And to some people, that has seemed like a very, very long time. To paraphrase that old spiritual our ancestors used to fame, we don't feel no way tired. We've come too far from where we started from. Nobody told us that the road would be easy. We believed that he wouldn't bring us this far. Believe <coughs> And that's why we're here today. We did not come to glorify or complain. We came to notate and explain. We only want to explain our ancestral love of freedom and call to the attention of all people that even though he was able to obtain his freedom. He also wanted to obtain the freedom of everybody else. And that's something to be proud of. Now, the purpose of, and goals of the Denmark, BC, and the Spirit of Freedom Monument Committee are as follows. To call to the attention of the people of the Low Country and visit us the efforts of African Americans to secure freedom. Number two, to give contemporary recognition to Denmark BC, to the whole affair, an event for which Antebellum Charleston was so well known and to place it in its proper historical perspective. Number three, to educate and to promote an abiding understanding of the African American experience. Number four, to demonstrate the universality of men and women's desire for freedom and justice irrespective of race, creed, condition, or color. And we hope that those who follow after us will remember these goals. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to all. As a tribute to Denmark VZ, who through God's omniscient was born approximately just a decade before the signing of the infamous document known as the Declaration of Independence, the seed to impart men to seek their own freedom was planted. With this faith combined with courage, he was able to overtly reveal the importance of civil liberty and serve as inspiration for the ageless black song of faith and struggle. As Balthazar met and brought myrrh to the king of the Jews the starry night, as Pedro Alonso Nino helped pilot the ship for Columbus to discover the new world, and we cannot forget Christmas Columbus brave shed the first blood for the Americans in the independence of this country. 
And lastly, to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who won the Nobel Peace Prize and was considered the most of the civil rights movement, walked across these hollow walls, these hollow grounds, many years ago. Jim Mulvey's a man of valor, bravery, and tenacity. We salute him today. Because of his art and faith in the Bible and his principles of fortitude, Mr. Bessie paved the way for so many others to make history in America, and this day we symbolically in world history. In 1772, the eve of America's independence, John Newton wrote his song, surely the epiphany of the voyage of the slave ship. He penned these song, the song of the ages. I chose a selection called Amazing Grace, I'll speak the song. And this song will be sung by a very dear friend of mine, Ms. Tracy Gant, will come now and give you the words of this song. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. And because we are here together, feel free to sing it with me. Ah, amazing grace, how, how, how sweet the sound. That shape a rich like me. I was once lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but I see when we be there, tears Bright shine, the sun. We to see God's grace. Then we. We first become Councilman Darby and just loving the old hymns of the church. And because you got here, we got here. So if we would just end it and just sing it, everybody, praise God, praise God, praise God. We do thank God for 
that melodious voice, amen? Yes. Grateful. Everybody's okay? Yes. Warmed up a little bit? Yes. Everybody's happy? Yes. This is not in the program, but uh, Mayor, is you going to take everybody to lunch afterwards? <laughs> he didn't say no. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, so uh, I believe you, you better go on our own. <laughs> now, Dr. Bernard C. Powell, History Department, College of Charleston, Revelance of Denmark, BC. Then, closing remarks, Mr. A. Dwight Sculpture. And after that, how the Monument Committee came into existence. Honorable Henry E. Darby, Chairman, D.C. Monument Committee, member of Charleston County Council, then I will return. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Unfortunately, I'm I'm kind of losing my, my voice here, and I hate to I hate to come after that split the solo. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of amplifies my inadequacy. But I will do the best that I, that I can here today. <clears throat> now, in 1963, when the writer James Baldwin gave a talk to teachers, he stunned his audience by saying this. He said that American history. <laughs> is longer, larger, more various, more beautiful, and more terrible than anything that anyone has ever said about it. And although we've come a long way since 1963 in the way in which we teach and talk about our history, much in Baldwin's assessment still rings true today. And the occasion that brings us here today is evidence of that fact. Today many people are still unable or unwilling to grasp the pertinency of both slavery and resistance to the full meaning of American history. And the unease that these subjects evoke explain why they're not adequately discussed in public school classrooms across the state today. And it explains why far too many in all communities across this state and this country, people do not know the name of Denmark Basin. And in part, I think that unease exists simply because people do not have a conceptual framework in order to understand what Basin did or a proper vocabulary for discussing the subject. As the mayor said, Busy was was free. He was free as free as any black man could be in antebellum America. But he was dissatisfied with the strictures that circumscribed his life and the lives of so many who were less fortunate than him. And among other things, certainly the persecution of the African church of which he was a member would have been particularly galling. So he organized a conspiracy, a conspiracy to rebel and to bring freedom to as many enslaved people as possible. And he hoped that that plan could be assisted by Haitians and also he hoped that many of the newly liberated could escape to that place. Now, the failure to understand Denmark Vesey is on one level a failure to understand America's revolutionary tradition. George Washington, James Madison, Samuel Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, they all denounced what they called the British attempt to enslave them. And that's the word, the phrase that they used but they meant it figuratively. Denmark Vesey borrowed from that same tradition and applied it to people who were actually physically enslaved. 
Basie's conspiracy, although unsuccessful, contributed to a train of events that would eventuate in another revolutionary change in American life and history, and that was the Civil War and Emancipation. In fact, during the war, when Frederick Douglass begins to recruit black soldiers, he encourages them by telling them to remember Denmark Basie of Charleston. Now, I would like for you all to think about something else also. And going back to something I mentioned just a few moments ago, Basie's plan to escape to Haiti and his hope for assistance from that quarter. And of course, he expected these things because he had been enslaved there for a period of time. And this episode is very important. It's a very important example because Haiti is the only example in, in world history of a situation where enslaved people overthrew their masters and then established an independent country that they controlled themselves. In this case, the effort was led by Toussaint Louverture and others. America's history is linked directly to those slave rebels because it was their success in that place that persuaded Napoleon to sell Louisiana to Thomas Jefferson, which literally doubled the size of America at the time. So, again, we cannot deny the pertinent role that a historic revolutionary tradition embodied by black people had for this country's history. So when you travel the black world today, you see monuments to the heroes of the anti-slavery tradition. In addition to this, heroes outside Cape, ha Cape Haitian in Haiti. In Curacao, one finds the National Tula Monument for the 1795 slave rebellion. Bridgetown, Barbados has the Busa Monument. And in Georgetown, Guyana, one finds the monument to the 1823 Timomara Revolt. These are just a few examples, but what they all shared was what Phyllis Wheatley, the 18th century writer, called the divinely implanted principle which we call the love of freedom. And she described it as impatient of oppression. She said it pants for deliverance. Denmark Basie shared the same indomitable spirit, and we are overjoyed today to add his name and his image to the list. And so by erecting this monument we create today a visual text in the landscape that will live on and challenge those who see it to learn of the terrible consequences of oppression, but also the marvelous blessings of freedom. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, greetings to you. Uh, and, you know, I had met you before, and I, you know, I run around the country and read a lot of city mayors and stuff. But you're the coolest. <laughs> <laughs> And the smartest, and the laid backest. <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, I didn't get an introduction, but they got me up here because I made this thing. Thanks for all y'all coming out. By the way, it was a little chilly. It's getting a little warmer, and so it allowed me to take my coat off. Uh, but anyway, thanks for all of you. I, I don't know what kind of crowd to expect from all that kind of stuff, but this, this, this is just absolutely fantastic. 
<clears throat> you know, I thought I thought what I would do um, uh, is, is is discuss the concept of, of memorials and symbols and icons and all that kind of stuff because we're just not getting into this. We've had years and years of, of the larger community uh, memorializing themselves. Parks are filled with with uh, statues and statuary and, <clears throat> and monuments and memorials about their great accomplishments. And, and we didn't get into this stuff until late. <clears throat> but I thought it would be even more instructive to use myself as an example of why uh, memorials and these kind of things are, are, are kind of important. Uh, I'm from Kansas City. Uh, uh, my lovely wife is here. My daughter is here. And both my wife and I have been on each other since we were two years old. <laughs> uh, I, I start, as a matter of fact, I went to preschool when we were two years old, by the way. Talking about myself, and we're talking about how the larger community affects people's lives and the direction of people's lives. Uh, and I started, I was doing art before I could walk the most. And I was, I was a school artist, a class artist in the kindergarten and elementary school and high school. Uh, and, and as I got uh, a, a little older, my dad uh, was a baseball player. He played in the Negro Leagues. Uh, and, uh, what was interesting, uh, he was an interesting uh, role model for me because this man uh, uh, went through the 10th grade in school and he left home to play baseball. And he played baseball most of our young life. Uh, and he ended up the chief chemist of the state green department in the state of Kansas. And so to, to, for him to make that kind of transition from a 10th grade graduate to an athlete, uh, to, to become the chief chemist of the state green department of the state of Kansas, uh, you know, was quite an accomplishment, and, and it was kind of a bit of a role model for me. Although at the time it didn't it, it didn't sink in. So when he asked me what I was going to do with my life, I I I, I told him oh, before that I had uh, uh, I, I had integrated uh, um, a white high school. My sister and I integrated a white high school back in 1947. <laughs> Uh, and, and so, uh, and, and to, what that means is that uh, uh, I went to Catholic schools all the way through, and I had one black teacher, you know, my, you know, uh, my entire life. Uh, after when I got to high school, I just took art all the way through school. They've been taking in physics or chemistry and all that kind of stuff. And so, and I had won the Kansas State. Uh, painting competition for the whole case state of Kansas. I won the first three ribbons, you know, with my paintings, and uh, I didn't know the Sister Dismas had even uh, entered me into this contest. But I, but from that, I got a scholarship to the Kansas City Art Institute, and so it made my old man a little bit nervous. So he sat me down and he says, "Hey, son, what you gonna do with yourself? I said, I'm gonna be an artist." <laughs> And he looked at me and says, no, you're not. <laughs> and he told me, he said, I'm not going to take care of you the rest of your life. <laughs> so I asked him, what, what should I do? And he said, you're going to be an engineer. And I said, well, what do the engineers do? And he said, they make money. <laughs> so uh, now you got to understand this. You know, life is, you know, if you got this dream, you're going to be this artist guy, you know, you're going to be the greatest artist in the world. And he said something very strange to me. He said, uh, you show me anybody, any black person, not anybody, but any black person, we, we were called Negroes in those days, by the way, that's making any money making art, and then I'll back you up, you know. And, and I did my little sneaky research, and I couldn't find nobody. <laughs> so I was making any money, making art. So uh, I live near an airport there in Kansas City, and the reason why I'm going through all this stuff because I, I want to work it back in, in, into what we're doing here today. But I live near an airport there in Kansas City, and I was out at the airport uh, every day doing something. When we were, you know, doing, so I got fascinated with flying. Uh, and so when my dad told me about this going to the engineering school and all that kind of stuff like that, all of a sudden I'm going, wait a minute, i got to reshape this green, this green. Uh, I, how do you do that? I mean, how do you think and, and say, uh, 
and how do you get it? What kind of education do you have to get? All these different things that I had visualized myself being this artist uh, all my life. Uh, and, and, and so what I ended up doing, I applied for pilot training. With, this is during the Korean War, and I applied for pilot training mainly because of this this flying background, going down to the airport and getting getting to fly around with all that kind of stuff. And I got accepted for pilot training. Uh, and, and so next thing you know, I, I in, in order to, to, to make that transition to pilot training, I was a paper boy from the time I was nine until I left home. And on the front of the Kansas City called the Black Paper, because I, again, I'm trying to figure out what, how am I going to get this done? And on the front of the paper, there was a black guy from Kansas City, short like me, standing on the wing of a jet. And I said, my God, you little black on the fly jet. <laughs> this is me. <laughs> so, so that's what I ended up applying for pilot training. And I also had, the, I went to engineering school. It was very tough because I had a background in engineering. Uh, but I, I, I was very uh, active and very avid, but I had to reshape my dream to be the greatest pilot in the world now. Okay, uh, And so then, from that point, I, I was a very hard worker, and I flew a lot and flew every opportunity that I can. And I got to the letter from the president who asked me if I wanted to be an astronaut. Now I'm going to wait, 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 wait a minute. That, that's a that's a that's a real stretch. <laughs> How the devil do you get to be from this the guy that didn't have any background in engineering? Uh, I got my degree in Arizona State, put some somebody with a degree in aeronautical engineering, and don't ask how I did it. But how I did it was I knew how to read. <laughs> that sounds silly, but I knew how to read. But but after that, I got out of the military. Came to Denver, and, and the story gets really kind of interesting now because uh, well, my wife and I bought this wonderful house in a, in a nice district there, and we ran out of money toward the end. I had to make art to fill the house up full of art. I made it myself. And then I, when I, I went to work for IBM Corporation, and I started out really nice, when nice dark blue suits and striped ties and all that stuff. And, and then somebody grabbed me and said, Right, you know, you're the next astronaut. Uh, you know, you got dressed better than that. You know, so I'll cut, so I'll come to work with four button suits and with the high collars and, and all this stuff with the yellow puffs and the ties and all that stuff. And Bob I come in. He said, "What? In the hell do you think you're doing? <laughs> this is IBM." <laughs> and, and so I said, "Look, if I got to change my clothes, then I quit." <laughs> and, 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 and so he pulled all of my uh, all of my clients and said, "Dwight, he's cool." But I, I was one of his top salesmen, so he couldn't say anything to me. But he said, he called me in his office one day and said, you know, you wear all them jazzy clothes and all that kind of stuff. We're, we're going to redo all our offices. And, and I want you to decorate them, but you got a sense of color. And I got my first taste of commercial art. I took the job, but I was only supposed to arrange it and manage it. And next thing you know, I have five kids. Next thing you know, we're all in the basement. And I, and I couldn't find anybody. I kept bringing this art to him, and that's not corporate. That's not what we want. So what I did was really slick. I drew down 200 copies of every brochure I've ever had, and we, me and the kid, went down to the basement and cut out the pictures of the brochures, and I made this collage, and they did exactly what we want, right? <laughs> this is it. <laughs> and so, so after I'd done all this stuff, you know, I, I, I gave him a bill. I said, this guy, I didn't tell him I was doing it. And so, and so, and, and so they, I, I gave him a bill, and I ran out of money doing this stuff. And I, and I said, I, my artist over here, he said, right, we know you've been doing this all the time. Uh, so in any case, I gave him a bill, and he scratched it and doubled it. You know. Anyway, that was my uh, introduction to art. Okay, And so and I knew, I thought... I thought, but then now we got another problem here, and the problem here is that you know when you go to parties and, and, and stuff, and you be in the social world, uh, and you say, "What do you do?" And back in the military, I would say, "Why well, I fly jet?" For you ask. Now, now it's just all these things Ashton I do. Now, you know, so, so, so you go to party. And you know, well, I used to be an astronaut, you know. <laughs> and, and so now I'm trying to think if I go to a party and say, "What do you do?" 
I'm an artist. Oh, you wouldn't starve and catch me. <laughs> <laughs> the end of conversation. Nobody got nothing more to say to you. I'm an artist. You know. So, so anyway, I had this issue. So I was running around. I was doing really, really well financially at the time. We had five cars, and my own Porsche, and my Mercedes Benz, and my 2000 Malibu and suits, and I was real cool. And, and, and we elected the first black utility governor in the state of Colorado. Yeah, my name is George Brown. We happen to be from Kansas also. George called me in, now the thing gets serious. George calls me into his office. He says, Dwight, I've been in your house. And, well, well, actually, we really have. I, I used to have all this art around my house, and we used to be in the party thing. And, and, and I would sell this art to these people, and then they came to the party. And my lady got mad at me and said, Hey, what's going on? And then they're walking out with the art. <laughs> so, it's such a, and so, and I used to sell them fifteen, twenty dollars. You know? <laughs> and so George, they bust them up, and they never paid me. Uh, and so he called me into his office, and he said, "Ed, he said, you're running around here, making all this money." Uh, I had a, a, a at the time I had left out the incorporation, but then I opened up a restaurant chain, that five restaurant. Uh, I, I had an aviation air charter service out of Staples Network, and I they had the suit. I had one of the largest land development construction company in Colorado. So George calls me into his office, and George says, "White, I want you to stop making all this money. I want you to stop doing all this stuff because I got a big, I got a big job for you to do." But first of all, they want to do a sculpture of me to put in the Capitol building as the first black lieutenant governor. Well, I hadn't, I, I didn't know how to model. I had never modeled before. I was uh, in my construction company. I would go out and get all the little pieces of metal and bring them home. Put me in the garage and I bought myself a welder and taught myself how to weld. And I was welding all these constructors. They you've seen these things made out of nails and junk and stuff. And then I was doing all that. And so George says, I want you to do a sculpture of me. And I said, George, I'll make a fool out of you and me. Because <laughs> I cannot make you out of nails. <laughs> so he says, right? He said, there's a library right down the street. Now you're going to have to get a book and teach yourself how to model. He said, because well, you're going to do this, because i got a big plan for your life. And, and so I went down and I, I did the sculpture in about three, four days. Not a lie, about a week. <laughs> and I, don't, I had no memory of doing this. I swear to God, I had no memory of making this man's. Uh, so I went down and got the book, and, and you, know, you get a pair of calipers, and you met that wide the nose is, you know, and how tall the ears are. And, all that kind of stuff. You're supposed to apply this to this to this head, you know. And so I, I did the sculpture and George, I went down to his office, took Polaroid shots, called in, he and Rosemary over to the house, and I took his glasses off and put them on the sculpture. And Rosemary started crying and stuff. And I had completed the sculpture of this guy. I had no idea how I did it, I swear to God. But he's still, still sitting in the Capitol building right now. So George came into his office to Ed, he said, You know what? You gotta stop doing all these things you're doing because you got a bigger destiny. And he says, Nobody has recorded the history of mankind. You can go all over everywhere and you find no black images of anything that African Americans have ever done in this country. And I looked at George. Don't get mad at me. I looked at George. I said, What did black people do? And he said, What? I said, Yeah, what did they do? I had not one ounce of black history tra training. I didn't, I didn't know who Harry Tubman was. So I was 42 years old. Uh, Frederick Douglass, Denmark Vesey, Nat Turner, you name it, Buffalo Soldier. I had no idea what this man was talking about. And so I, he says, you are, he called me a pitiful inward is what he called me. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you be saving yourself. I, you know, when I was in the space program, I, I made some 5,000 speeches all over the country, right? He said, Ed, what were you telling them? I, I told them to be like me. <laughs> be like me. You can be the moon. And, and, and so Jordan went back to his office, and I had two sacks of books. I had no idea where Jordan got those books, and it had the history. I didn't even know that that was slavery, but I'm serious. And, and I started reading the books, and I got really upset that somehow I missed all of the all the stuff uh, and all the stuff that made Denmark BC Denmark BC. I had no idea, and I was 
flying uh, by wire. I'm just flying out in the air, floating around, being affected by things. It's really what was really going on. Okay? And, and so all of a sudden, this man, I'm, I'm sitting down there reading these books and reading this history of all this accomplishment. Uh, because I thought that they invented black folks when I became an astronaut. <laughs> that sounds crazy, but that's how crazy we get. We get into these little bubbles, you know, and, and, and we live in these bubbles. So anyway, I started uh, I started with Buffalo Soldiers. did a Buffalo Soldiers series that traveled all over the country, uh, and then uh, they park, got involved with Park Service. And so it, it was amazing uh, from the time I got started and I started doing this, and I didn't even know there was a market for it, but I had never thought about selling it. I, I, I thought about doing it, but I hadn't thought about selling it. And all of a sudden, the Park Service grabbed a hold of me and did shows for me, and I was shipping bronze and sculptures all over the United States of America. Okay? And, and from, from, from that early group of, of the, the National Park Service gave me the black uh, Frederick Douglass, that the first big sculpture did was Frederick Douglass, by the way. And so, in, in any case, uh, I, I learned all this stuff, and I got really passionate about it. And so now we are, I've done 120 memorials around the country. That almost a country. But, but, the, but the issue is, I, uh, I, I want to thank the, the, the group of, of, for, for having the faith in me to do, to, to do this memorial. But this was a fascinating challenge for me because in all the other instances. That was an image of some kind. There was no image of this man, okay? Right. But it's really what's fascinating about this thing is that when black people write about black people, this is really interesting. Uh, they talk about the way they look, more than they talk about the, what they did. Uh, and, and I read it, I, I went and bought the logs, uh, I got an antique store and I bought the logs in Lewis and Clark expedition. And there was a whole thing on York, and, and, and he, was, he was Clark's slave. And, and, and he would come and say, he, uh, York walks in, six foot eight inches tall, and, and he's got these big white teeth with the big lips uh, and, and the little beads of sweat, you know, and his hair is, is, is curly and it's close to his head, you know, and he's six foot eight inches tall. And, you know, and, he, and they would talk about, and I would get all these little cues, and I'm an inveterate reader. So as I began to read about Bessie, uh, how in the world could I do this guy? Uh, to make a fake Bessie, because there's no picture of this man. But on the other hand, uh, if you follow that line of reasoning, when you start reading the history about it, and I have to get deeply involved in the history of people in order to do them, because I built sculptures from the outside in, uh, and it was about his spirit and the things this man did, and the brilliance, I mean, this was a brilliant plan, they got, they, they got blown all the hell. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm thinking, <laughs> just think about this. this is deep stuff. Uh, this guy was free. And we think this, uh, this idea about property. Okay? And, and, and my readings of what, is, what he was about had to do and, and I want to take a different tack here, on a, a, a different metaphor. He thought about the concept of property, and he was property. This man was a slave, but then he was free. Now, when he was a slave, he, he was a, somebody else's property. Okay? But the idea when you get to be free, you, you, know, you become your own property. And the whole idea is that what you want to happen is to be, is to be owned by yourself. You want your you want to own your body. You want to you want to